Welcome into another edition of the Blue White Breakdown brought to you by Penn State Health. Week four of Penn State season. I believe it's our fourth episode of this podcast airing every Friday. Daniel Gallen here. I'm Dustin Hawkinsmith. We're talking some Penn State recruiting, which we'll get to, I think, a pretty fascinating topic in a little bit. We'll catch you up with the last few headlines of the week. James Franklin's availabilities and uh, some things of, of that nature. Um, first things first, Daniel. Um Derek Tangelo, I thought was an interesting interview this week. And I know, um, I know you wrote a couple of things on Penn Live, PennLive.com slash Penn State Football. Uh, just his arrival from Duke, um, being a really good fit from the beginning, being a pretty logical relationship that developed when he opted to transfer from Duke because he had some history with, with Penn State. But can you just speak to you know what you saw and heard from Derek? Good timing of his, his availability too, after a pretty good game he played against Auburn. Yeah, I mean, one of the plays that has been talked about a lot uh, in the aftermath of that game on Saturday night was uh, Tangela's chase down of Jarquez Hunter uh, after Hunter hurdled uh, Joey Porter Jr. on the right side. And that play has kind of been a a theme uh, for some of these Penn State guys uh, on the defensive line. Uh, Arnold Abichetti also had a play where he rushed Bo Nix and then, you know, made a play further downfield. But you know, when you look at Derek Tangelo, uh, talking to him yesterday or on Wednesday was, was very interesting. Um, he's a guy who, when he was coming out uh, of the Bullis School, which is familiar to Penn State fans, uh, Christian Bayou went there, um, Cam Brown, Jonathan Holland, and if you want to look outside of the Penn State universe, uh, Dwayne Haskins went there. Um, so that's a, a pretty big football program. But, you know, Tangelo was just a three-star recruit. Uh, he wanted to go to Penn State because uh, he saw guys like Brown and Holland there, but you know Penn State didn't really recruit him. Uh, he didn't have an offer. He was a three-star recruit. I think in the composite, he was outside the top 1,000 nationally, so he wasn't really you know the type of guy that that was on the radar um, for Penn State. But you know, after his four years at Duke, he wanted a challenge, uh, so he put his name into the transfer portal. Thought he could go somewhere and have an impact. Um, and he pretty much said that as soon as Penn State reached out to him, uh, you know, things were quiet at first, but as soon as Penn State reached out, he was good to go. That's where he wanted to be. And I think it's really interesting just in the early going. I know we're three weeks in, but you look at what Derek Tangelo has brought and Arnold Ebicati and those, those two in particular, because you were really rebuilding this defensive line and hoping for the best with two transfer guys. And I think you've gotten so far, pretty much the best case scenario from both of these guys to reinforce that defensive line. And it's, you know, with, with a guy like Tangela, I'm sure that Penn State, there were some things that they liked about Derek coming out of the Bulla school, but maybe weren't able to really offer him at that point in time. But he's a really good example of, of going shopping in the transfer portal and getting somebody that you got some familiarity with, getting somebody who was just some development time away from being able to help your program out. So he went to Duke. He got that development going. He, he found his way, and now he's able to come in here. And I think, you know, with these two guys in particular, as well as A.J. Lighton, who has his uh, – his speed's been impactful on, on special teams and John Lovett, who we first saw against Auburn after the sort of bizarre disciplinary slash, whatever his suspension was. Um, but it, it's just uh, a blueprint, I think, moving forward with the transfer portal. Like the, these are guys who are helping now. And it seems like Penn state has, has kind of found their way in terms of how you evaluate these guys and which transfer players you're looking at. Yeah, and I think when you look at Tangelo's recruitment and you kind of think about the type of player he is and kind of what Penn State brought him in to do, you know, they brought him in to be that number two defensive tackle next to P.J. Mustafer, you know, to be kind of a, you know, he's shorter on the stouter side to kind of help, you know, fill some space, free up the linebackers, free up Mustafer, free up guys off the edge. And when you talk about recruiting, you know, I don't necessarily think that that's the type of guy that you recruit you know, if you're a Penn State, you know, you want, you recruit guys like Mustafer, guys who can come in, you know, be those big instant impact kind of guys uh, in the middle there. And so I think that that's kind of a good example of what you can use the portal for is to kind of find those role players. You know, obviously, you know, you do recruit role players, you do recruit guys who kind of, you know, will find their niche eventually. But, you know, when you bring guys in and you're recruiting at a high level at Penn State, you're thinking instant impact, you know, or just, impact players in general uh, with some of these guys. So I think that having a guy like Tangelo come in through the portal, uh, you know, I think that that's kind of a good way to approach it is, you know, where do you kind of have these holes, you know, kind of 
fit the pieces together and kind of complete the puzzle. Whereas with recruiting, you just want to get the best guys who can, you know, make the biggest impacts, do the best things for you. And I saw th- this idea um, came up. Lane Kiffin was talking about Alabama uh, a, a day or so ago and was talking about how they're pretty much unstoppable as it is. And now they've got the transfer market. So if they, you know, all, when they do have these little holes pop up on their roster, they're able to shop and, and find it. And this is, you know, not, the transfer portal isn't new, but it's a, it's a new wave of it with the, with the exemption from last year and, and guys being able to transfer without penalty. So um, I, I think it's something you're going to see moving forward. And I, I would also throw in there, you know, the Lackawanna College and the JUCO route too is it's the same deal. Guys that maybe Penn State has had relationships with, but they weren't ready to offer them coming out of high school. Jaquan Brisker might be a good example of that where they go and, and somebody else takes, takes uh, control of their development for a year or two, and then they're ready and Penn state swoops in. It's a, it's an interesting topic. It's not something that Penn state has done a lot in the past, but surely not just them, but everybody is going to be tapping into this going forward. Yeah, definitely. I think that it's one of those things where, you know, it's going to be a couple of years before we see kind of the, the distinct impact um, you know, obviously a school like Alabama, you know, if they want, they can pick off, you know, these top guys in the portal. But, you know, James Franklin has talked a lot about fit um, as something being really, really important. And I think that when you, you know, from what we've talked to guys like Tangelo and Epichetti, like they they fit, you can kind of see it, you can feel it. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe next year, if there's some holes, there might not be guys that fit. Um, and that, and so I don't think we're going to see Penn state bringing in six or seven guys every year. I don't think we're going to see a lot of the top programs, uh, necessarily doing that just because, you know, these programs are, are all about development. Um, you know, especially somewhere like Alabama, you know, Nick Saban's process, the whole thing, um, is that they really want to bring guys in from day one and kind of mold them the entire way through. So, you know, I think that it's something where on paper you can be like, oh yeah, like, Alabama is just going to get all the former five stars that are in the transfer portal. But, you know, I think that kind of in practice, things are going to look a little bit differently. Um, you know, I think it's kind of similar to, you know, NIL, you know, it's going to be a couple of years before we kind of see what that actually looks like, what that impact actually is the extra year of eligibility. Um, you know, I think that it's easy to kind of forecast that, Oh, all these guys are going to be staying for fifth and six years and there's going to be a huge roster crunch, but I don't necessarily think it's going to look like that in practice. So the portal is interesting. Obviously transfers have always been around, but you know, the development of the portal to kind of, you know, as a database uh, for schools and, you know, the last year's waiver and now the one-time transfer rule, you know, I think that, you know, the waters are choppy right now. They need to settle. We'll see where the ripples end up. And I think Penn State's waters were especially choppy with the way that 2020 went and, you know, some of the guys who ended up leaving and some of the pieces that they weren't able to really recruit at at their fullest. So this was a unique year, but, you know, both of these guys, you know, that we're talking about on the D-line, Abikati and Tangela, there's a certain, you know, as you mentioned, a good fit but also like a hunger factor. These guys didn't come for much. They weren't blue chippers who just fizzled out someplace else. I don't think Penn State really necessarily wants to be in the market for former five stars necessarily because you're bringing in former five stars. You're bringing in guys who have different types of expectations and different types of, you know, uh, what they're looking for. So these guys who were, were, you know, three stars, they, they're coming in here and they're, they're using this opportunity to try to get to the next level. And I think Penn State's helping them with that. Uh, another name that came up this week, and certainly against Auburn, Tyler Warren, the you know the the number three tight end on the depth chart. I think going back to spring, there have been a few cautions from James Franklin and some of these guys in the tight end room. Like, don't forget about this guy. Like, you know, everybody know Brenton Strange and Theo Johnson, really good one-two punch. Everybody's been kind of sprinkling in there. Don't forget about Tyler Warren. And and you saw against Auburn when they're when they're using the tight end so much. And you saw that wildcat package, which is just um really uh fascinating to me that the usage of that because his skill set coming as a like this kid could be playing co- as a college quarterback somewhere. So now he's 6'5", 255 pounds or whatever, and he's, he's back there. We've just maybe seen the tip of the iceberg with that package, but I think also with him as a player, what came up with, the, with these guys and uh, you know, what they have to say about Tyler Warren, I think Theo Johnson in particular. 
Well, Tyler Warren's actually six foot six, so short changed him an inch right there. Yeah, yeah, uh, my, my bad, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, every time I write about the tight ends, I kind of, you know, list out, you know, that they're all, I think Johnson and Warren are both six six in the 250s. Strange is six three in the 250s. It's just a, a massive group uh, of individuals back there who are who are all athletes. But, you know, Theo Johnson earlier this week called uh, Tyler Warren, you know, the, the best kept secret um, on the offense that, you know, he's someone that Penn State has, has really been excited about given his his tools uh, and his ability, um, his athleticism, you know, his basketball tape has come up uh, a decent amount. You know, um, I talked to his high school coach who said that, you know, Tyler was was dunking in eighth grade. Um, you know, he came in to, to Atley High School outside of Richmond at, at six foot three as a freshman. And it was kind of clear that, oh, this is going to be our quarterback um, from the jump. So he's someone that you look at his kind of pedigree, you know, played three sports in high school and was good at all of them. Um, and kind of how he's come to Penn State. I think that, you know, his development has been, you know, something that I assume that behind the scenes, they were very excited about over his redshirt year. And now we're kind of actually seeing it. Um, and, you know, I, I guess we're going to see more of him uh, as, as time goes, as time goes on, they put those three tight end packages out there and, it's really hard to kind of see how you match up with that, um, especially when, you know, I think that they, they ran some, some 12 personnel with two tight ends, but they had Johnson and Strange split out wide. So they're essentially in a four wide receiver set. You know, Mike Yersich can get really, really creative with these guys. And I think that's going to be a, a really fun subplot because everyone says that there's still so much more of the offense that we haven't seen yet. And I figure that Tyler Warren uh, and, you know, probably figures into some of that. In, in multiple ways and what the, what they've been able to build. And I thought about these guys, you know, the, the week three thing through week through two weeks. Like I think you have a new offense. You can only roll out so much of it at once. You can own like, you're, you're not going to be crisp and pristine in the running and passing game and usage of the tight ends and all these different things. But I thought Auburn was such a good display of Mike Yersich's mad genius and the options that he has to deploy that mad genius. And these tight ends are really good examples of that because all three of them can run, catch, they've got body control, but they also seem to really appreciate their role as blockers, you know, I, and, and I think that's the thing that Penn State has established at the tight end position over the last few years, going back to Pat Fryermuth too, is these guys who obviously outstanding athletes, big, fast, all that, but really appreciate all the components of a tight ends job and so when there's three tight ends on the field they could all be blocking they could all be going out on routes you you have no idea as a defensive coordinator and that's a uh, pretty nightmarish when when the three athletes you're talking about are these three guys yeah that was a question that came up to all the tight ends this week was you know through the first two weeks of the season I think they the group only had three catches um, Theo Johnson had his first career touchdown catch, but it was in the fourth quarter against Ball State when the game was was already out of hand. So, you know, they hadn't really been, you know, I guess from the outside, they hadn't really been involved. But, you know, to talk to them, they, you know, they said that they know what their role is. They know the game plan is going to be different every week. And so kind of like what you said is that, you know, in, in three games, you can only show so much, you know, you can only do so much, especially the type of game you're going to have where, you know, against a team like Wisconsin, that's kind of in the trenches. You're going to slug it out a little bit. Team like Auburn, more speed on the field. You can spread things out a little bit. You know, maybe use those tight ends a little bit differently to try to get those mismatches and, and stuff like that. So I think, you know, kind of like what you said, that you can only show so much. And I think we're going to see more, um, but it's going to look different every week. I don't think it's going to look like the Auburn game every week, you know, against Villanova this weekend. Well, who knows what it'll look like against Villanova this weekend, but, you know, against Indiana, it might look more like Wisconsin against Iowa. It might look more like Auburn uh, vice versa. So I think that it's going to be really interesting to see kind of how exactly it, it kind of settles out, you know, maybe how it, how it evens out where, you know, there's the, the quote unquote balance um, because you, know, you look at the stat lines, the, the tight ends combined six catches, 130 yards. Um, and then, you know, if you look at Jahan Dotson averaging 7.8 yards per catch, uh, Parker Washington averaging less than that. Um, and, you know, it was, it was interesting, you know, they were able to get the tight open tight ends open in space while the you know wide receivers who you think of as the, the big play guys that you're going to hit downfield, were kind of doing that underneath that you kind of think of the tight ends doing. So, you know, it's just, it's a lot of fun to think about and kind of, you look at 
it just feels like there's so many more options now uh, on this offense. It's a real Swiss army knife type feel to this offense where what, whatever, whatever the adjustment has to be or whatever the opponents is giving you or taking you taken away from you, Penn state seems to have the ability to attack and exploit either way. And, you know, I think one of the things you mentioned how tight Auburn made the field feel and ball state tried to do that too. Um, you can't really march the length of the field and take what the defense is giving you if you don't execute really, really well. And I thought, you know, again, especially against uh, in all three of these games, but especially Ball State and last week against Auburn, the execution within that had to be crisp. If you're going to go eight or nine plays down the field, if you're going to take the short stuff that that they're giving you, you better make sure that everybody's in the right places. Every, you know, all the timing and rhythm is, is, is in a good place. And for Mike Yersich and, and these guys to be at that place so early in the year has been one of the, I think, more promising storylines because after, after last year's debacle, you couldn't take that for granted, but I think just to see them so crisp and clean um, is a, is a factor in all this too. All comes back to the quarterback, <laughs> you know, the quarterback make, if the quarterback's executing, he makes the tight ends look good. He makes the wide receivers look good. Uh, you know, Sean Clifford completed more than 87% of his passes uh, against Auburn, which is just kind of insane. Like, I don't think it's something that uh, you would think of when you think of Sean Clifford um, and I don't, I don't know what his exact yards per attempt was, but you know, it wasn't all game. It wasn't all, you know, these short underneath things, you know, he went downfield, you know, he hit guys in space where they could get yards yards after the catch. So, you know, I think that they looked really crisp uh, and you got to give credit to, to Sean Clifford. Uh, when you look at that, um, you know, I think James Franklin was asked earlier this week, whether or not he sees kind of like a new Sean Clifford this year under Mike Yersich and, you know, Franklin, said that you know, he didn't really see it that way, you know, went back. Clifford got them to the Cotton Bowl in 2019. They won 11 games with him as a starter. Um, and, you know, he said this is the Sean Clifford that, you know, he always expects and anticipates to see. Um, so if if that's the Sean Clifford they get every week, outlook of the season, uh, I think, changes a little bit in a, in a pretty positive direction. Yeah, it just looks to be in total command and, uh, you know, making the throws. And to your point, too, just about – I don't really think that there there's not a lot of easy throws, even on a college field. There's not a lot of what I would call easy throws. And even on some of those easy throws, let's say swing passes and stuff out wide. It does seem like the ball placement is allowing guys to make plays after the catch. He's not just getting it in their hands. He, I, I think has put guys in position to then make a play with it. And if that's what, if that's what you're doing against a team like Auburn, you better be able to get Jahan Dotson in a place where he can do something with it after the ball is in his hands. Yeah, I think that the one thing that you probably want to see a little bit more of uh, from Clifford is the deep ball, um, you know, contested deep balls. Uh, you know, he had he hit Dotson uh, against Wisconsin for the touchdown, but then he had the one throw later in the game where he underthrew him uh, and Dotson came back for it for a big gain. Um, and, you know, against um, against Auburn, the tight ends, he hit them downfield, but they were wide open. Um, I saw a screenshot on the one Brenton Strange play. I think it was a the 40 yarder, um, you know, down to the four where it was there in a wacky formation uh, with Caden Wallace split out wide. And, you know, I didn't really realize that in real time. And, you know, that's one of the things that helped, you know, Strange get wide open. So, you know, I think that the scheme can do a lot uh, getting these guys open. But, you know, I think that Sean Clifford has probably answered every challenge uh, that he's gotten so far. But, I think that if, if you're nitpicking and something that you want to see, you know, maybe against a team like Villanova, um, a game that, you know, should not be that close. Um, you know, I think that you want to see him try to hit that deep ball, um, you know, hit guys in coverage, throw it downfield. You know, I think that's kind of the, you know, Auburn and Ball State didn't let them do that. So I think that that's kind of the, you know, as kind of test driving uh, the offense under your stitch, so to speak, is you know, kind of see if you can hit that in the gear and kind of see what that actually looks like. Well, I, I think that, and, and probably it goes hand in hand as we transition into talking about this Villanova team, Penn State, a 29 point favorite um, as of now. Uh, I think 
you know, maybe establishing the deep ball. What else do you want to see in this game? Um, I think, you know, I think a shot of life in the running game probably is a, is another, is another big piece of it, whether that's Noah Kane or whether that's getting somebody else involved. You haven't really seen, you know, Kevon Lee had that burst of energy against Auburn, but then he puts the ball on the turf. It's like, you know, I, I think to see the, the ground game established from an offensive line standpoint, push these guys around a little bit. And then maybe see a secondary option to Noah Kane emerge. That's kind of my checklist for them. Yeah, I mean, I think that the number one item uh, on my checklist is just lots of Taquan Roberson. Uh, that's what I keep coming back to is that you got to get him the game reps. Um, you know, the the start to the season was a little bit unorthodox um, with kind of the the opening game against Wisconsin and then Auburn in Week Three and kind of the the tougher or the you know the tougher of the lower lower level teams in week two with ball state you know and you know i think franklin said that the drive where uh they wanted to get roberson in earlier in the fourth quarter the defense couldn't get off the field because it was the backup defense so that kind of delayed him getting on the field a little bit so you know i think that this weekend you want to see penn state start fast get out to that lead uh, and then get roberson as much time as possible because you look at this big 10 schedule and where you know where will Taquan Roberson get reps if it isn't injury related or anything yeah so this is kind of where you gotta you know you need to get Taquan Roberson on the field you need to get some of those younger guys in there um, so that when it comes to you know in a month two months if you're in these situations where you have to turn to some of these younger guys you have they have confidence that they've done it on the field already and you have confidence that you've seen them do it on the field already even if it is Villanova so many positions where they're able to do that naturally, you know, the defensive line, they rotate often. They've rotated a, a, you know, a few, a handful of guys in on the offensive line. They do that at the, you know, linebacker, cornerback safety quarterback doesn't really allow you to do that. So you got to take your opportunities. And to your point, seasons usually start a lot slower than Wisconsin. And then there was nothing you could take for granted against ball state. And then it's Auburn. So this is the closest thing you've got to a, to a, a blowout potential game. We'll see if they're able to get it there and, and maybe get it there early enough that they can get Robertson on the field for more than a drive or two. So we'll see. Uh, mentioned before, and James Franklin ad addressed uh, Micah Parsons and Odafe Owe, the, their play so far. And I saw the stat from Pro Football Focus, I believe, those two guys, one and two among rookies in the NFL and in, in quarterback pressures. Parsons, I think, has 11. Owe has seven. In week two, the second game of his professional career, Owe is the AFC Defensive Player of the Week. Unbelievable play late. Um, to force a fumble, just just punch punching the ball out of uh, Edwards Hilaire's hands. Um, but Franklin said he wasn't surprised uh, by by that. I don't think a lot of Penn State fans are surprised. And our topic for today, uh, long walk for a short drink of water, I guess, but is the 2018 recruiting class because both of those guys were in it, as well as Pat Fryermuth, who was a second round pick, as well as um, Jahan Dotson, who's on his way there. You have a lot of fascinating storylines in this class, but those two guys, Rasheed Walker, uh, should could and probably should go in the first round in 2022. So you've seen some adverse outcomes in that class, but as you're looking at this thing in total, I know you saw some of these guys at the opening um, prior to those guys signing, but um, that class really fascinating as it was unfolding, but also looking back on it, you know, all the different outcomes, but I think you can't call this thing anything but a huge success. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the most fascinating thing uh, that, you know, the most fascinating outcome or thing about that class might be uh, a player who did not end up in that class, who's making his first NFL start uh, this weekend in Justin Fields, uh, who was originally committed to Penn State. You know, Penn State got in with him early uh, and got him on board, and then he just shot right up, ended up at Georgia, you know, Ohio State, now at the Bears. Um, and that's kind of wild to think about. I think that that's kind of a, a subplot that you, you kind of forget uh, when you look at that class, especially given the guys who actually made it to campus, you had three star or three five stars: Parsons, Justin Shorter, Ricky Slade. You have guys like Owe, Dotson, Walker, Fryermuth. It's just so many guys that succeeded. A couple guys, a couple really high profile guys that didn't work out, and then you have a, a pretty solid middle class of guys that you know are still on the roster, have roles. Um, so I think that you look at 2018. It was James Franklin's highest rated class, you know, during his, you know, however, eight or nine, seven or eight, nine cycles, however many it's been. Uh, and 
you know, I think that they kind of, they got that value out of it. High expectations. And I think um, not perfect. No, no, like it's, it's a pretty, as you go back through and look at former classes, you know, if you go back to 18, 17, 16, go back in time, it's a pretty sobering lesson on, on expectations. And the reality that if you sign 25 guys, there's going to be three, four, five of them that for whatever reason, they don't develop, they aren't happy in state college, whatever, all the different scenarios are in play. Um, but I think Penn state has done a good job of getting the most um, out of a lot of these classes. And this class, as you mentioned, Justin Fields and Justin Fields, I, I felt like was a huge win and a huge blow for, for Penn state and their evaluation of players, because this is a kid from Georgia who Penn state was on before anybody else, before his star really took off and, and rose. And that ended up hurting Penn state later. The fact that his, you know, his reputation grew like that in the end, I think it was always going to be hard to get um, fields out of Georgia. His sister was going to um, going to play. She was playing softball at Georgia at the time it's in his backyard going North to the cold of state college. It's a, t- it's a tough draw either way. Um, who, who knows how the future of the program could have or might have changed with, with him on board. But uh, Micah Parsons, don't forget, was committed and decommitted and then recommitted again. It's some, I, I don't think, I, certainly with a high-profile player like this, you almost never see a decommitted player recommit. They all say that they're still considering that school. They all say, hey, I've, I've decommitted. Penn State's still in, in my thinking. I don't expect that. But for Micah Parsons to do that for, as a five-star player, um, really fascinating storyline in this class too. No, for sure. Uh, yeah, that was pretty pretty wild. Couple of weeks, couple of months uh, with that commitment, decommitment, that that whole ride. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think that you look back at at 2018, and it's kind of the there's a good balance between showing what Penn State can do as a program, where they brought in. You know, a guy like Parsons, who was who was the five star and you you knew, you know, from from day one, this guy is going to the NFL. Uh, and then you have guys like Owe and Dotson, where Owe was just very raw. He had all the athleticism um, and it was just kind of a question of, of developing into someone who could get on the field, hold his own uh, and which he did. Obviously, uh, James Franklin brought up the the no sacks last year and the production side of things. But, you know, I think you look at his his tape and you look at him as a player and you kind of see, wow, he made some strides. You know, he developed into this. And Dotson is similar where Dotson was a four star recruit. He was a good wide receiver uh, out of Nazareth. Um, but since he's been here, he's taken that leap where he's kind of, you know, the catches that he makes just on a on a weekly basis now are insane. Um, you know, I think he probably had three catches uh, against Penn, against Auburn where you're like, whoa, I mean, that first touchdown catch, you know, Clifford, that ball comes out of Clifford's hands and you don't really know where it's going. Dotson hauls it in. Uh, he makes the one hander. You know, I think that you know, he's been maybe it's the most fun I've had watching a player in person in a really long time. Uh, and you kind of see that he took that step, you know, from being, you know, like, OK, four star, like solid college can contributor and now you're thinking oh you know day two nfl draft pick probably early on day two and with the way that nfl teams use wide receivers and want wide receivers maybe you could sneak into day one it it wouldn't nothing would really surprise me at this point and by the way that touchdown catch goes up he gets both hands on it but in the in the midst of completing the catch has the swag to shift it to one hand you know, like the, 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 the confidence in, in his hands as well, as well, he should have confidence in his hands showed on that play where he, 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 he finished a highly difficult catch with, with style too. And I, th- I thought I, I could watch that replay again and again. Um, I was more preoccupied with him getting both feet down. Cause usually when, you know, they're running in the corner like that, and, you know, it's college, you don't have to get one down. You know, I thought that, oh, his stride might just naturally take him out, but he gets both feet in goes to the ground. The, the, the strength of his hands has shown up a bunch of times. And that's a, that's a development thing. And I really think Taylor Stubblefield, uh, Penn, Penn State, it, it was a revolving door at the wide receiver, that the leadership of that position. And, until Taylor Stubblefield, who his career was a revolving door before he got here. Uh, I thought James Franklin saw a little bit of himself in Taylor Stubblefield because James Franklin looked like a Rolling Stone too. And I think he kind of explained at that point in time, um, 
wh- how it's ca- not always your control. It's not you just wanting to go from one stop to the next. Coach can get fired or whatever the case might be. And I think he thought Taylor Stubblefield was that guy. And boy, I mean, you, you talk about turning a negative situation, wondering if they were going to be able to develop wide receivers to what they've got now, where they've got some proof here now and they've got some stability at that, at that position. Yeah, I the wide receivers have been, you know, fun to watch this year because they're you've got guys that all have different skill sets, but they can all contribute. And when you look at young guys like Parker Washington, Kondre Lambert Smith, the steps that they've taken forward, you're kind of like you can see the trajectory, you know, continuing. And I think Dotson is kind of an example of that. Well, that's all we've got for this edition of the Blue White Breakdown. We're aiming each and every Friday. You can check us out on YouTube, all the different podcast platforms on Penn Live as well to try to strike this 50-50 mix between talking about what's going on with this Penn State football team and picking one recruiting centric topic uh, to to try to talk about at length. And why not the 2018 class with what Parsons and and, uh, Owe are doing at the next level? So uh, we'll, we'll take a break here. We'll come back again next week. That's Daniel Gallen. I'm Dustin Hawkinsmith, and that's it for this edition of the Blue White Breakdown.